Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, our first webinar for February uh, for 2018. Uh, welcome aboard. I am at a different premises today. I'm actually at a client's premises today. Um, I'm preparing a client for our very first CRICOS audit, which is going to be in two weeks' time. So we've got lots of prep happening at the moment uh, for this client who's going to CRICOS. And I can see we've got another client on Line who we have in a month's time going to CRICOS audit. So um, got lots of prep for work that we're doing at the moment, uh, getting ready for CRICOS. Okay, welcome to today's webinar. In today's webinar, we will be going through standards 1.7 and DPR 4.1. For those of you who are currently an RTO and you're already up and operating, you are required to submit an event miss report at the end of this month. So we will be going through standard GPR 4.1, which is all about event miss reporting um, at the end of this uh, first section. So we're going to go through support services first and then we'll go through uh, event miss reporting. So if you are currently an RTO and already up and operating on the 28th of February, you will be required to submit an event miss report. So we'll be going through that today. Uh, I think I was temporarily disconnected then. I'm back on now, so that's fine. Um, so this webinar forms part of your continuous improvement process under standards 2.2. Following this web webinar, you should hold a Q&C meeting and include in your minutes that you attended this webinar. This is very important for everybody to include that they attended this webinar on their minutes because that forms evidence of your professional development. Everybody who attends this webinar live will be uh, issued with a certificate of attendance, which you can also use as evidence of professional development um, that you've attended this webinar. We're doing well today. We've got eight people online, so it's excellent. So if you have any questions whatsoever, please place them in the chat box uh, to the left of your screen there, and I will answer any chats that you have along the way. So any questions that are specific to 1.7 and DPR 4.1, which is your event misreporting. And then at the end, if you have any additional questions, I'll also go through those as well. Uh, but please do not hesitate to post any questions as you think about them, and I'll go through them. If I can't go through them right now, I'll go through them later. Um, um, but this is an interactive webinar, so the whole point is that you should post questions and I will answer those questions as I, as I move along the webinar. Okay, um, as per the policies and procedures, you should minute anything that we have um, gone through today and identify are you doing what the policy and procedure says? So you should review the policy and procedure, so standard 1.7 and DPR 4.1. If you are not doing what this policy and procedure says, then you should review your policy and procedure and identify do you need to update the policy and procedure or do you need to ensure that you are actually complying with uh, what's happening in the, within the policy and procedure. Okay, with regards to policies and procedures, I just thought I'd let you know, um, because we're working on all our CRICOS uh, documentation at the moment, we are also updating our policies and procedures uh, within the Q&C manual so that they match across to the CRICOS manual. And the reason why is with the CRICOS manual, we only want to have policies and procedures that are relevant to international students. And then in the RTO policies and procedures manual, we only have what's relevant for the VET sector. So that doesn't matter whether they're CRICOS students studying overseas or students studying in Australia. So, um, uh, but we'll be making some minor adjustments. You may have noticed that we updated the training and assessment strategy document recently and also the enrolment agreement form recently. So if you go on to Unicorn, you will see under your documents, there are two new documents there. So you'll have to go to the Q and, uh, so the TAS, uh, which is under training and assessment strategy, and you'll need to go to enrolment agreement form, which is under student forms and download the new forms. Um, the training and assessment strategy, we've already started, commenced, 
uh, redeveloping that to include cry costs. And um, we've got a lot of student clients who are delivering training overseas. So we've also adapted the TAS template so that it meets the requirements of delivering training overseas. So if you have checked that out as well, you'll also see there's a lot of information in there that would be um, relevant if you're delivering training overseas. Okay, standard 1.7, which is support services. And when we look at cry costs, uh, standard 1.7 is also covered um, under a couple of other standards within cry costs as well. And it's very similar to how they're doing that. So if anybody's interested, um, 1.7 is also covered under the national code under standard 6, 9, 10, 11 and 13. So because uh, with uh, international students, is that there's a much bigger focus on um, student support and how you're going to support the student throughout the training. So this is relevant across both boards, across both domestic market and international market. So support services is what the RTO determines that the uh, have they have determined are the needs of the individual learners or learner cohort that they have selected for their training. So within your training and assessment strategy, which we went through in the last webinar, the key component of developing the training and assessment strategy is really identifying who is your learner cohort, what are their skills, current skills and knowledge before they go in to do your training with you, and what um, what skills and knowledge do they have to have in order for you for them to complete this training? Uh, the support services is, is how you will provide that support to the students, taking into consideration the uh, prior needs and knowledge of the students so that you've identified, okay, this is what we have identified as our typical students. So our students have low language and literacy, for example, or they come from a non-English speaking background, or typically they only would have finished year 10, uh, or it could be they have academic level education and that they need to get uh, this qualification that you are delivering in order to meet licensing requirements. So you should really identify who are your learner cohort and what are their current skills and knowledge Knowledge, and that's how you work out what support services you'll need to provide to those students in order to meet those needs. The biggest component when you're looking at support services is identifying what are your current student needs. So you need to identify through the collection of a variety of data. So you can do that through the enrolment agreement form, um, uh, do undertaking an LNN assessment quiz, undertaking a training needs analysis. So if you're working with a company or a large industry sector, is doing undertaking a training needs analysis of that industry sector or that company. The services you provide should be relevant to your learner cohort. So whatever support services you're going to provide, how is it going to support the students that you have in place? Now, just because you we're stating here that you're going to provide support services, it doesn't mean that you need to personally have a counsellor on site on your premises or um, you need to have, you know, uh, support services in academic studies or anything like that, it means that you can have referral services to assist those students as well. So there's a range of ways that you can provide support. Systems and practices for ensuring students are supported throughout their learning. So when you look at um, identifying what are your target group needs, you need to really identify what are their current English language is it English as a second language or is it the first language? Uh, would they have typically completed high school or have they completed schooling or education overseas and then come into Australia? Um, what are their physical capabilities? So it could be that you are delivering a qualification or a unit of competency where it require the student to um, uh, have physical, be physically fit. So, for example, is provide first aid. Uh, the students need to be physically fit to be able to get up and down off the floor. So you need to be able to identify what are the physical capabilities required of your students when they come along and do this course. Um, 
I just got a question. Any LNN tool that you'd prefer to use for CRICOS? Okay, so there are a couple of um, different LNN assessments. We have two LNN assessments included in our documents. So we have one at a certificate level and one at the diploma level. So first, uh, Ajoya, definitely go have a look at that one. Um, the other one, there are some great online um LNN assessment services that you can use. Uh, there are some, there are actually some that are free out there as well. So there are a range of LNN assessments that you can use. Um, with CRICOS, I recommend that you get uh, like an online type of LNN assessment is actually quite good because it means you can get the student to uh, complete an LNN assessment prior to entering into Australia. So it's a good way of being able to identify um, the LNN capacity before, prior to arranging uh, to them coming into Australia. Um, the other one with CRICOS is doing um, that they need to meet a certain IELTS score uh, or that they've done an English capacity course already uh, within their own um with our own country. So there's different uh, different places that you can go. So what I'm just going to provide, so I'm just looking up some resources that you can have a look at and I'll pop that in the chat box uh, that would be relevant for you to have a look at. I've been tr I'm just trying to find, there is a free one out there and I'm sure it was under the Australian Core Skills Framework but I can't seem to find it. It used to be on the training.gov website and it looks like they've taken that off now. So I'll just see if I can. Oh, yeah, new national vet data. Oh, no, that's the vet data. Updated traces. No, I don't think they've got the link on there for. They used to have the link on there for um, for this free database because they were trialling it at the time, but they were looking at. Good assessment tools that I've seen online. Uh, that you can use and you can send them out to the clients, uh, to your students prior to course commencement and they can do the whole LNN assessment online. I'll just see what I can find for you and pop a couple of links in there when I have a look because uh, there is a whole heap of different ranges of tools that you can use. Um, the best way, and this is what I'm doing at the moment, the best way is to uh, just do a search on LNN assessment. You'll find a whole heap, uh, a whole heap out there uh, that you'll be able to access. So there's a couple that I've just popped in there now. Um, there was one by, uh, it was the LNN robot or something like that. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, this one was quite good. I saw a demo of this one at the VEL conference and I find, found it quite good. It was really good to, easy to follow and it what it did was adjusted to the different language and learning levels of the students and it uh, works within the Australian Core Skills Framework as well. I can see you can get a, a free three-week trial on it as well. A lot of the software systems will have a basis where you can have it free or at a cheaper rate until you get your registration. So it's a good one to have a look at. But yes, definitely check out the LNN robot. I saw that at the conference and was quite impressed with that one. There are a few databases now that are also offering LNN assessments on their database. Um, I think there's one on Accelerate. Uh, they've included one within theirs. So th there's lots of different options that you can have a look at. I can highly recommend uh, anybody attend the VELG conference. Um, and the main reason why I'd recommend that you do that is to have a, a great, um, I'll just see if I can find the link to it. They've got a, uh, a big section for Expo on um, where different providers come along and you can see lots of different products and things like that that they have um, available. And it's going to be held in Sydney this year. So it's actually quite a good venue uh, for anybody who's particularly from Sydney um, who might want to check it out because not only will you get the training that they have there and they have a lot of speakers who speak at that conference and I have spoken there before myself, um, they also have a whole heap of 
uh, resource providers there as well. So it's a good way of um, checking out what, what's available there. And, th and that's where we see a lot of resources when, when we go to those. Okay, so I hope that helped you out there, Joy. Um, so you really need to look at the entrance requirements of students entering into courses. One of the things that we're recommending for CRICOS, now that I've uh, fully thrown myself into this, I've been studying CRICOS now for three years, but now I'm just fully immersed in it. And uh, that's where the majority of my work is going at the moment is into uh, CRICOS because it's quite extensive. And we've got a new national code that's just come out as well. So I'm getting my head around that. And the big thing is... Um, when you're looking at students, if you are considering CRICOS, is to make sure that you, um, like I wouldn't recommend uh, taking on any students under the age of 18 because there's so many more requirements that you've got to meet when the students are under age of 18. So that's, that's just something to take into consideration. Um, but you need to look at the entrance requirements, including their age, qualifications and experience and require prerequisites like skills, um, their skills, prior skills and knowledge. So big thing that's been coming up um, with when we go to audit is there's a huge focus on uh, prior, so existing skills and knowledge of the student and they really want you to be clear within your training and assessment strategy what is the uh, prior skills and knowledge of your students and where are they currently and what support may they need uh, due to um, their existing skills and knowledge. And so there's a big focus on, you know, what are the, uh, when you're looking at an RTO, what is their um, prior skill, not an RTO, sorry, a student learner cohort. It's really looking at uh, what are their current skills and knowledge. So I'm just going to share with you, I'm just uh, checking out the TAS template. So we're just going to go through, uh, quickly have a look at the TAS. Uh, yep, we're going to have a look at that one. Oh, application window. Look at this um, TAS with you. So this is the new TAS template. So go on to training. Uh, sorry, on um, just if you just go on to the um, unicorn, you'll find this template is now in there. There's been a couple of changes with the template. We've now got a cover page on the template, and we've got a temp. Uh, table of contents and the reason why we've done that is because it makes it easier to navigate uh, through the document but one of the key things um, we did go through this in the last webinar so I'm not going to go through this extensively but it's this section when we go down to target client group section this section here uh, under section two existing skills and knowledge is a huge area that ASCO are really focusing on when they come to to the audit and this is where you've got to identify through here who are your learner cohort what are their existing skills and knowledge and from this you should identify what are your um, support services that you're not going to need to provide in order to meet this learner cohort's needs so it's really important that you're very clear with who are your target audience what are their existing skills and knowledge so that when you go to do look at support services your support services are going to meet the needs of these students so you'll see here i've got now cry cost section so that cross cost session is now in there so everything in red is cry cost uh, we have a selection criteria and this section here is client needs this is the l and n section so this is where we identify not l and n sorry this is the support services section. So this is the support services that we've identified would be uh, for the typical learner need on the left-hand side, What would, how would you meet those needs is on the right-hand side. So you really need to take that into consideration when you're looking at the support services that you're going to provide within your RTO. So I highly recommend you get onto that uh, TAS template and download that TAS, TAS template because that will really help you with identifying, you know, what are the current requirements. All right. So that's looking at, at, uh, at client needs. So sh they should be identified prior to course commencement and as part of your strategy is through the use of the enrolment agreement form. So when you set up your RTO or you put a qualification on your scope, you'll get your crystal ball out and identify, well, who do I think will be our learner cohort when they commence with the RTO? Once you commence, you then need to rework your training and assessment strategy at least six to 12 months following your commencement of training and rewrite that learner cohort section so that it actually addresses the 
current and actual learner cohort that you have. And that you can get from the enrollment agreement form template. So on the template, we're going to have a quick look at the enrollment form template as well. And I'll just pop that one open for you. Um, so the enrolment agreement template is where we actually identify what are the learner's needs um, in that template. And for some reason, not opening up. Let's see, there we go. Okay, so I've just got open the enrolment agreement template. I'll try and enlarge this as much as possible. Okay. So this is the new enrolment agreement template and one of the things that have changed, um, there's a few things around the event miss data that's changed, so what you're collecting. But what we've done within the policy and procedure is use this event miss data as part of your identifying the student needs. So once you've commenced your training and you're delivering it, in here you're collecting a whole heap of data about a student identifying what their current needs are. You can use this information not just for reporting your data to ASQA or to NCVER, you can actually use this data for identifying who are your actual learner cohort. This should all be entered into your student database and you should be able to then kick out a report from the database that actually gives you an average of what are where are your students coming from. So in here is things like in which country were you born, do you speak a language other than English at home, they talk about disabilities, what year did you finish school, what other qualifications you have. So this is a big area that we use to identify whether the student's would be required to undertake an LNN assessment. If your students have completed a certificate three or higher, they should not be required to complete an LNN assessment unless they're doing something really technical and different. Um, you may have some other entry requirements. But if they've completed a certificate three or higher, they should have met the language and literacy requirements. Well, hopefully you should believe that they do. Um, not necessarily, not all courses are the same, not all RTOs are the same, not all qualifications are the same. So, um, but as a, as a general rule of thumb, it should be any student that's completed a certificate three or higher uh, should meet the LNN assessment requirements. So you can, we've got that in the policy and procedure that you can do that, um, have that in there. Um, so that's one I, one way of working out what are their current uh, skills and knowledge, um, whether they what are their, is their employment status and their reason for study. But a lot of this other stuff, do they speak English at home? Is English is a second language? Do they have any disabilities? You can get a collect a whole heap of data on here that will assist you with identifying what are the needs of your students. Now you'll see on the third page, we have a section in there that are interview questions. These interview questions are also part of forming uh, what are your support services requirements for your courses. And in general, you should be collecting a bit of data from th this form when students are enrolling to identify, you know, where are they coming from? What do they want to do? So why have they decided to do this course? What current level of experience do they have now? Are they limited uh, or do they have extensive experience? Um, this is where you can collect a range of data and identify, well, do we need to adjust our courses to the typical learner cohort that we're attracting into this course? So are they trying to get a job? Are there any specific needs or assistance that they require because they have a disability or um, they might require some support services or they find language and literacy difficult? Um, and then we have you know, a section here where we can provide further um, support services. Is there anything that they would like some assistance with? So we've got some uh, questioning around there. So this section here is also under standard 1.7. So where we're identifying uh, what are the support services required uh, for our students. So actually I'll just keep that open for when we do vet miss data. Okay. Uh, so that's what the enrollment agreement form. It collects a lot of that data uh, to assist you with identifying what are the support needs of your students. Okay, so that's the enrolment agreement form and we I also went through the interview questions there. So language, literacy and numeracy to be completed prior to course commencement. So a lot of people get confused about when and where should they ha have um, undertake language, literacy and numeracy. Now, if your typical learner cohort, so we've got... Um, 
one example of a client that we're working with at the moment who are going to be delivering drone licensing. So part of the drone licensing requirements, um, they've got two distinct learner cohorts. So one is school students. So school students who are wishing to do a drone license course, uh, it might be for recreational, but it might be also so that they can um, go into other careers um, that may require a, a drone license. So they're going to be new entrants and they're going to need you know, full volume of learning and going to have, uh, they're going to require l and assessment. There's going to be all sorts of things that they're going to require because they're new entrants to the industry and quite young. Their other learner cohort is students who currently work and they're working as engineers, they're working in the mining industry, they're working on farms, they're working on construction sites, um, they're working on a variety of roles where they're going to need a drone in order to complete their role. So they've already got qualifications and skills and experience of working in the workplace and a lot of their qualifications are um, higher ed qualifications so they've got degrees so and now they're going back to do a certificate three level in order to get a license in order to be able to operate a drone uh, a drone so in order to do that they've got to meet the requirements of the course but of course because they've got extensive skills and knowledge already they're not going to be required to do everything from scratch again so we've actually put for their entry requirements um, we've put their existing skills and knowledge are they hold currently hold a higher ed qualification uh, they have you know minimum of three years industry experience within their industry uh, we, we can even put their age range of how old they currently are um, and they're not going to be required to undertake an LNN assessment because they've got to have a requirement that they meet all of these other um, high, hold a higher ed qualification and things like that. Now, due to this, we're able to bring the volume of learning hours down because they are um, already have this higher ed qualification and they're not going to be required to do as many hours as the school students. So the school students are going to need a lot more um, face-to-face hours with the trainer assessor. They're going to have to have a lot more experience in operating the drone drones, whereas the higher ed um, engineers and uh, students that were uh, coming already from the workforce, they've already operated a range of equipment that not not the same as a drone license, but very similar types of equipment. And they're more mature and they've had more extensive experience of working in the industry. They already know the industry, so they know what they're looking for. So for example, someone working in the construction industry needs a drone in order, instead of putting up scaffolding to get to the corner of a top of a building um, so that they can see whether there's a crack in the concrete or the, the bricks or whatever. Um, they can get a drone to go up there instead and the drone and using a camera, they can identify um, whether they need, what work do they need to do on that damage that may have been caused to the building. So it's going to save a lot of time and money for them to be able to operate a drone to be able to uh, get it up there to be able to view all of this. So they're going to have a lot more extensive experience and knowledge um, and we, we've outlined that in the, um, we've outlined that in, within the uh, training and assessment strategy um, and we've identified what are their prior skills and knowledge. Okay. Sorry, I've got emails going off in the background. Turn that back on. Okay. Um, all right, so it's really important that you identify what are their current skills and knowledge and then from that, what type of language literacy and numeracy will you need them, require them to complete? So if um, if they currently hold a certificate three uh, or higher, um, is it really necessary? Is it really necessary for them to undertake an LNN assessment or can we just um, uh, utilise their prior skills and knowledge uh, in order to meet the requirements of LNN? Now, the other thing is if you're going to be using things like they must hold a Certificate 3 or a higher ed qualification or something like that, you need to collect evidence of that as part of their enrolment requirements and that's how you get around the LNN assessment.
because you've collected evidence of them having completed another qualification at a higher level. And then that forms part of their enrolment process and the reason why you didn't conduct an LNN assessment. Um, the purpose of an LNN assessment is to determine what is the level of support that you need to require them. You, you'll need to provide to them. So what is their prior skills and knowledge and where where do you identify would be the gaps that they would need assistance with? So another way to identify that is through a training needs analysis. Um, through this form of uh, assessing, the way I would recommend it, we actually have a training needs analysis uh, form on the on Unicorn that you can use. It's specifically for people who are working with maybe a company or an organisation now where um, they could contextualise. So they actually go in and interview the business or the operations and they interview staff within the organisation, including management and down to the coalface workers, um, are identifying what are the skills gaps that they have. And, and it's a real good way for an RTO to go into a business and identify what their current needs are and then contextualise a qualification or a course or a short, short course that will meet the needs of that organisation because you've really identified what are their learner cohort needs and how are we going to meet those needs? And the, like a training needs analysis is perfect for that. So if you, like I know we've got um, a couple of clients who are working in the restaurant industry, um, you could go um, meet with a range of different restaurants and actually identify what is a train need, training needs analysis for their business. Um, great way to do, a great uh, strategy for this is to I go in, identify what are their training needs gaps, and then develop some training that would meet their needs. Instead of a full qual, you can actually do, put together units that meet their needs within the organisation. So it's a great way of identifying what are your target audience needs. Okay, so that's basically support services. So in the policy and procedure manual, you'll see we have a whole range of different support services that you can provide. Um, there's also uh, you know, undertaking the LNN assessment using the enrolment form, and that's in general what the policy and procedure is. But the background area of that is really identifying, like we have a support services list, so you should really be looking at your support services list and identifying well, what are the support services that we need specifically for our industry? So it's not just um, it's not just looking at the support services of um, uh, sorry, it's not just looking at the support services list that we currently have. It's really looking at who are the students that you have and what are the support services that you need to put in place in order to support those, the typical learner cohort that you've got coming into your organisation. So I'm just going to bring up a support services list. So this is a support services list form that we have that you can contextualise for your organisation. Services list. Okay, so this document you can get on Unicorn as well. So this support, this is a generic support services list where we've put um, services that are available nationwide across Australia. So you've got Alcoholics Anomalous, um, Australia.gov.au, which is uh, covers a broad range of assisted support, including LNN, um, Adult Migrate. Uh, migrant English programs, Beyond Blue, Black Dog Institute, New South Wales Community Help. So there's a whole heap of things in there. And we, what we've done is we've identified the name of the organisation, website that the student can go to, a phone number, an email address, and then what are the client needs that we're addressing in um, for with this service that we are referring them to. Now, a trainer assessor can use this support services list to assist a student or they give this support services list to a student when they're having any issues or concerns. As a trainer assessor within the organisation, you should be assisting the student in any way possible that will support them throughout the training. You'll find in general that most trainers and assessors are very caring people and they all want to help the student anyway. This gives them a mechanism to be able to provide them with a list of different services that are available. 
Now, you should contextualise this for your state. So you should include any support services that were local to you. So, uh, so first of all, statewide, so support services that are uh, specific to your state, but you should also put support services that are local to you. So you might have a range of support services like a migrant resource centre that's nearby. Um, you might have a community centre that's nearby that provides assistance or free counselling or something like that. And you should add those to this list because this should be a living, breathing document that your staff can use within the organisation to assist them with identifying, you know, what support services can they provide there uh, to the students um, if they are having any um, issues with uh, within their training. Okay. All right, so that's the end of support services. All right, now on to DPR 4.1, so event misreporting. So both the applicants seeking initial registration under the Act and MBR registered training organisations must have a student records management system that has the capacity to provide the National Vet Regulator with the vet miscompliant data. So that means you must have in place, so for initial registration and once you are registered as an RTO, you must have a database in place that collects a vet mister data and can submit reports on that event list data or you should be able to uh, at least be able to download information from your database that you can submit for your event list data reporting. So I've just got a quick uh, video here. We'll see if it's going to play. Don't think it wants to play. So thankfully I kept this video open <laughs> and we can have a look at it. Uh, maybe I didn't. Okay, YouTube. Um, so there are a range of videos that you can check out on NCVR, uh, which has a range of webinars and uh, all sorts of different recordings on uh, how to, on a vet misreporting and what are the requirements of a vet misreporting. So I found one that was only eight minutes long. It wasn't very long at all. Uh, See if I can find find it. Yeah, there it is. Welcome to the National Centre for Vocational Education Researchers free web-based Avetmus validation software. For the duration so I was telling you about there being a free validation software that you can um, access at the moment. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, bring this screen up and show you this webinar. Okay, so it's uh, this was of this video, video, the Avetmus validation software will be referred to as AVS. To access the AVS, go to www.avs.ncver.edu.au. So this is the free to get started, um, database please sign that in you here. can access to in order to here submit you your can see the messages, data. collections. So and I'm just going to send you a link to that webinar so you can check that out. It's only an eight-minute uh, recording, so it's not very long at all, and it just shows you how to access that free EventMIS validation software um, where you can validate your EventMIS data. So there are a range of databases that you can access that uh, can do uh, valid, uh, so uh, uh, collect where you can collect EventMIS data and then submit that data directly to NCVR. So there's a range of software where you just enter it in your database, click a button, and it just sends it there. If you don't have a database that does that, I'm going to show you the other way that you can do that. Okay, so what is a vet miss? All RTOs have an obligation to report to the National Vet Regulator, um, uh, National Provider Collection, that is to complete a vet miss reporting. Unless an exemption applies, your RTO must report all vet student enrolment activity conducted in 2017. So from January, 1st of January 2017 to 31st of December 2017, and or award any certificates that you've issued throughout 2017. So they want to know commencements, 
and completions, and they really want to identify how are you going with commencement, like how, what's your ratio of commencement to completion. So they want you to um, enter that data that's sent to NCVR. Basically, the data that NCVR uses, they use it for a range of different things to identify um information that they need to develop their training, to develop training packages, but it can also be information that they use to identify where are the skills gaps, uh, where do we need further training, uh, where do we need government funding. So it's really important so that the government can identify, you know, who are the learner cohort currently and what, where should the government funding go? Where are we not? So it might be that we have a lot of skills gaps in um, in different industries or councils or states or across the board nationwide and then they want to identify well are we getting enough students who are commencing and completing uh, training in those areas and if not is it because it could be that there's lack of funding or something like that um, particularly if it's a skill shortage so they'll want to identify you know what government funding should they be throwing at really uh, in what direction for what qualifications so that's basically what a vet miss data does but it also it's a bit like um, census data collecting census data so it's identifying what are our needs within the nation and how do how can we improve practices so a lot of the government departments use it to identify you know where, how are we going? How are, we, are the students who are commencing actually completing? What's the ratio of commencements and completions? Um, is there a reason why they're not completing? It could be, like I know in some industries uh, they're not completing because traineeships are taking too long now. Students are expecting to finish in a shorter time frame. So the government has actually identified that students don't want Kids these days coming out of school don't want a two-year apprenticeship. They just finished fifth, 13 years of school. They then don't want to be stuck into a you know, two, three, four-year apprenticeship. So they have identified that they need to fast-track these qualifications, which sort of clashes with volume of learning, but we won't go there right now. Okay. The RTO is required to report any VET activity, including uh, activity that attracts government funding and activity that does not attract government funding, uh, and activity that is conducted in Australia or overseas. So it could it also includes any data that you've collected of training, delivering training overseas. So your students overseas must also complete an EVETMIS data or your enrolment form. So your enrolment application form and on the back, on the front, sorry, where it has all that EVETMIS data, they've also got a, you've You've also got to collect that as well and I and notify the government of that. Um, and it's due to be submitted to uh, NCVR, not ASQA, uh, by the end of February, so 28th of February. Who needs to report? If you have not reported data through a state training authority or board of st school studies, so it might be that you're currently uh, delivering training under a government contract, so you actually have government contracts in place for state funding. Uh, you will be required as part of your state funding requirements to submit a vet miss data reports. Now, it may be that you only submit a vet miss data reports for the government contracts and you do actually deliver uh, fee-for-service courses as well, but you haven't reported on those. You will have to do that as part of your vet miss reporting. If you're doing it on a regular basis, um, NCVR, so um, you must report directly to NCVR. So all this reporting you've got to submit. So you've got to do at least one annual one. The other one you're doing on a monthly basis or weekly, depending on how you're doing it. Uh, but on an annual one, you need to submit uh, to NCVR through its Vetmis validation software system, which is that YouTube link that I sent you there on how to do that. Uh, It opened on the 2nd of January uh, and you must submit the validated data report by 5pm Adelaide time on Wednesday the 28th of February 2017. So it should be a simple matter of getting it out of your database and then uploading it to the validation software. So that's what you should be doing. If you're currently offering government funding, it is a requirement uh, of your funding to submit event miss reports more regularly to claim your funding. So... 2018. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> Sorry, Raji. <laughs> Thanks for that pickup. I actually had to, that, I must have had it wrong last year too, because I had, I did change that date. Um, what I, so it opened in 2018, but the 
data you're submitting is all of 2017. Thanks for picking that up, Raji. Okay. Where is the data? Event missed data is identified in your enrolment agreement form. So that's where I was showing you. Um, it should be on, let's see if I can get it open. So on the enrolment agreement form, uh, you've got, yeah, there we go. Sure. Uh, so on the enrolment agreement form, on page one is all that event missed data. So everything that has a number next to it, so you've got one, two, three, four, all of these with the numbers in it must be entered into your event missed compliant database and then that database should have a mechanism to be able to submit a report or uh, you should be able to get a report out of it that you can then submit onto the uh, event missed compliant software so you can go through that way okay all right that's that one um all right next uh the da this data should be entered into your event miscompliant database your rto is required to meet these data provision requirements as a condition of your registration ASCO may impose regulatory penalties if your rto does not meet these data provision requirements now we actually saw last year um, i heard of an rto who actually got fined for not submitting their vet miss compliant data so it is starting to happen. So you need to make sure that you are submitting your reports. Is it good enough to show the ASCO auditor receipt of a vet miss service provider during the initial audit? Yes, you can do that. Um, the vet miss database, I think you mean. Um, yes, you can show the receipt of the vet miss uh, compliant database. In initial registration, they also want to see that you know how to operate that database. So they want to see it open. It depends on the auditor. Different auditors have different requirements. For some auditors, particularly if they don't know the database, if it's not one of the popular ones, they'll want to actually see it. Whereas if it is if it is more of the popular ones, so WiseNet, JobReady, uh, VetTrack, Accelerate, um, they'll basically just want to look at a receipt. But some auditors will actually want to see you operating the database. So, um, yeah, so I highly recommend that you have the database in place and that you are skilled enough to be able to actually show the auditor um, how to uh, get to the certificate register, which is what they want to see. I hope that answers your question, Anissa. Okay, so that's the enrolment agreement form. Okay, so for more information, I recommend that you go to uh, these websites. So there's a couple of webinars on there that you can go to, not webinars, recordings of um, uh, recordings of other you know, webinars and things like that that they've had there. But I also, a bit is recording. I had all these websites. Oh, there it is. I knew I had all these up. Um, so there's different websites that you can go to. So it's the EventMIS website that you need to go to, it's NCVR, sorry, in order to um, submit your report. So basically you'll generate it from your database and then you'll update, upload that report into um, this EventMIS uh, NCVR database. Uh, now, in the policies and procedures manual, we have a range of different ways that you can do that. So go to DPR 4.1 within the QNC manual, and it actually goes through step by step how to submit an event miss report uh, to NCVR. But I also recommend that you check out these uh, hyperlinks here that I've got uh, for different um, pages on the NCVR website. Uh, we've been updating, so we updated the enrolment agreement form to meet because there was new, there was a new um, event misreporting requirements and standards that came out. So we've been rewriting against that. So there are some good information on there on how to update your database and do your um, event misreport. So through NCVR. 
So hopefully that'll answer all your questions. If you have any additional questions, you can now throw them up and I'll answer. So it can be about anything to do with compliance. Um, if you, you can, even if you, I know we've got a couple of clients on here who are also in CRICOS, so I don't mind answering those CRICOS questions as well. Uh, we'll be holding our first CRICOS webinar next month in March. So we're just waiting for a couple of audits to be knocked over first before we um, deliver our first webinar. Uh, so they, they're being scheduled and everybody who's on the CRICOS uh, membership will be invited to the CRICOS webinars, which are going to be held once a month as well. Uh, and that's where I'll be going through a couple of the national code standards um, each month for vet misreporting. So, so no bit misreporting, cry costs. So national code for um, international students. So I'll be going through that. Okay, quick question. We have a training calendar which lists non-accredited training. Just wondering, can I list accredited training on the same calendar which is set out to member organisations for day training, e.g. first aid, safe food handling, et cetera, and on our website? Yes, you can, definitely but you make sure that it is clear what is accredited training and what is non-accredited training. I worked with a community um, uh, community services, sorry. I worked with a community college and with that community college, they had the same problem where they were advertising accredited and non-accredited on their website and on their marketing um, and it wasn't clear You've got to make sure it's clear what is accredited and what is non-accredited. So you can have it on the same page, but you have a section and you make sure it's you can, it's very clearly defined. So you might have a table at the top that's accredited. All of these are nationally recognised uh, qualifications and units competencies. Um, and then you have a different section, which is non-accredited. These courses are not accredited, nationally recognised qualifications or courses. Um, they are non-accredited training. So as long as it's clear what is accredited and what is non-accredited, check out standard 4.1 in the policies and procedures manual because it's all under marketing um, what you should have there. So it's got to be clear what is accredited and what is non-accredited, um, but it's fine to have it on the same website. One thing that you've got to be really, really, really careful with is anywhere where you're promoting any non-accredited training, make sure that you don't have the... Um, uh, NV, uh, sorry, the uh, oh, NRT logo or the AQF logo. So you've got to be very careful with the NRT logo and the AQF logo and that they are only next to the code and title of the training product that you are delivering and it's not confused anywhere on your marketing that's a non-accredited course that it may be accredited with the NRT logo or the AQF logo. So they're the main things that you need to be concerned about when you're marketing accredited or non-accredited training together. Hope that answers your question, Judy. Excellent. Any other questions? I like it when I get questions. You can see I'm pretty good at jumping on them straight away. <laughs> You see, I do this day in, day out. Um, a lot of the times I'm at audits, so you'll see that I travel around a bit. If you follow our Facebook page, you'll see that I'll pop photos on there every now and again of locations of where I am. Um, at the moment, I've just been full on focused on CRICOS and we've got two clients we're prepping for audit at the moment for CRICOS and we've got about another three who are coming up very soon. Um, but we've got two with audit dates. So I'm spending a lot of time writing policies and procedures. I've had my head fully in CRICOS sector at the moment and um, we're getting ready for these audits. And the big thing that I'm really doing is looking at our policies and procedures for international students. As I said earlier, we've got a lot of clients now who are delivering training overseas to international students. So even though they don't have to comply with the CRICOS requirements, there are a lot of policies and procedures in there that would be relevant to their students that they're delivering overseas. So we're doing a full rewrite. I'm, I'm focused on uh, rewriting our CRICOS manual at the moment and looking at how we can adapt our current forms and documents. Um, but Due to that, it is affecting. It is going to affect the QNC manual, uh, and mainly because we're improving the policies and procedures, particularly for those students who are also uh, clients who are also delivering overseas, or maybe even thinking about uh, delivering in CRICOS. Uh, I can definitely recommend uh, moving into CRICOS. There is a lot more involved. Uh, there is more focus on the student and the building. 
and how are you going to provide support services for that student. Uh, but it is where the money is. There's a lot of money in delivering training for international students. There's also a lot of opportunities to deliver training overseas. So it might be something that you might want to uh, consider as well. Uh, okay, so just let me know if you've got any more questions. Otherwise, we're going to sign off for today. Um, I'll just see what our next webinar is. So next webinar is on the 5th of March, so Monday the 5th of March. And I keep thinking I need to put this timetable at the end as well. Uh, and next month we will be reviewing... Dun, dun, dun. Oh, yay, assessment tools. Woohoo! So standard 1.8, which is all about assessment tools. So we're looking at rules of evidence and principle assessment, 1.9, 1 1.10, 1 1.11 and 1.12, which is all about assessment validation. I'm sure you're very excited about that. So validating assessment tools and what is the process there. Now, this is a lot of information to fit into one day. Anybody who's currently a client should, um, they've all, if you're doing kickstart, reboot or uh, cry cost package you're all invited to go along to our assessment validation workshop and rto compliance workshop we do a full day on rto compliance and a full day on what is an assessment tool what are the validation requirements and things like that so there's one full day for rto compliance and one on assessment validation And we're going to be in Sydney, I think it's 22nd and 23rd of February, uh, delivering these workshops. I'll be delivering these workshops on the 22nd and 23rd of February. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending today. I look forward to catching up with you again soon and next month at our next webinar. Thank you very much for attending. Um, if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to get in contact with the office where you can speak to one of our client liaison officers who can answer any of those compliance questions that you may have and or if you need any further assistance assistance with um, your event misreporting, they're happy to help you as well. Thank you very much for attending today and I look forward to catching up with you next time. Bye.